Hello, everybody. This is Introduction to Silicates for Cosmochemistry. Let's start by talking about the abundance of elements. In the universe at large, hydrogen is by far the most abundant thing by mass. It's about 74%, with less than 2% of the universe being made up of stuff more massive than hydrogen and helium. But once we get to the whole Earth, for instance, uh, now we're, we've got a composition where the Earth is actually mostly iron and oxygen, followed by magnesium, silicon, and then only about 9% of the planet is made of other stuff. If we then go to the Earth's crust, which is where all of the minerals are that we interact with, we have a completely different composition, with the composition of the Earth's crust being dominated by oxygen at nearly 50% and silicon at about 30%, with uh, aluminium or aluminum, and iron coming in next. Uh, and you can see that there are only a small number of elements that make up the majority of the mass of the crust. In fact, there are only eight elements, oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, and magnesium that make up most of the rocks in the Earth's crust. And in fact, if we go to the whole Earth, it's mostly oxygen, silicon, magnesium, and iron. So let's go back to a more spatial view. The universe by atom is about 94% hydrogen. The most abundant thing after hydrogen and helium is oxygen at a small fraction of the percentage of hydrogen. Again, this is by number of atoms, not by mass. Now, if we look at other elements here, and in this case, this is normalized to a million silicons. So we can see here we've got one million silicons. There are 20 times more oxygen. So silicon would be a 20th in this chart here. Um, and we can see here, this is the most abundant elements down to titanium, and it's dropping off fast. So compared to silicon, we've got about a tenth of that in uh, aluminum. We've got even less in calcium, sodium, nickel, and so on. And so what we've got is not that many elements to play with once we're looking at stuff out in space. So those most abundant elements, unsurprisingly, make up most of the minerals, both on Earth and in space. Now, I want to just digress briefly, because this is for non-geologists. And a lot of the time, people are confused about the difference between rocks and minerals. So basically, what is the difference between a rock and a mineral? A mineral is essentially something that is a single composition and a single crystal structure, has a very definite composition and crystal structure, whereas a rock is made up of an agglomeration of minerals. So to give you an example of that, here I've got a picture of granite. Granite is a rock. It is made up of a number of different minerals. In this case, it's made up of this black mineral here, which is called hornblende, this pinkish orangish mineral, which is a potassium feldspar, and this white mineral, which is quartz. And so you can actually see them where they're embedded in this. So the granite is a rock. It is an, a, a naturally occurring aggregate of minerals, whereas a mineral, is a naturally occurring substance with a unique chemical and physical composition and structure. Technically, that means that it is definitely crystalline. It has a specific crystal structure, and we'll come back to that later. There are, in fact, 78 mineral classes. There's a lot more than 78 minerals, but they can be broken down into different classes according to gross composition and structure. Of those 78 mineral classes, 27 of them are what we call silicates. And I'll come back to what the definition of a silicate is shortly. And 92% of the Earth's crust is silicates. So what are silicates? Well, silicates are made up of what we call these silica tetrahedra. This is where we have a tetrahedron pyramid with an oxygen at each of the four apices at the apexes and a silicon in the middle. Uh, you can see here that the oxygens are much bigger than the silicon. And when you do that, You've got a silicon, which is a four plus, and you've got two, two minus ions, which is the oxygen. And so what you end up with is something that is a four minus ion. And since this is a naturally occurring thing, it must be neutral. So when you have minerals, you have combined these silica tetrahedra with other things in order to make them neutral. And we'll be having a look at that as we go along. Now, there are different ways that you can arrange these silica tetrahedra. So here I have just an isolated tetrahedron. This is one of these SiO4 4 minus anions. 
And what you would do with this is you would add in some two plus, a couple of two plus ions, so cations of metal that would then charge balance it. But uh, this particular series would be called olivine. We'll get into this in a little more detail. But then you can also have them so that you have two of the tetrahedra stuck together. And in this case, they're sharing one of the oxygens. So the ratio of oxygen to silicon is going down. And then you can have it so that there's a big long chain of them. So each of the tetrahedra is sharing two of its oxygens and it's joined onto another one. Those are called pyroxenes. And then you can also have a double chain. So this is where you've got two of those chains, but now they're stuck to each other. Uh, you can imagine that you could then continue this by adding on another double chain to the side of this and another one. So you end up with a full sheet where each of the tetrahedra is sharing three of its oxygens and the one at the apex is not shared. And so you get sheets. And then you can imagine where you have all four of the oxygen atoms shared so that each tetrahedron is directly next to the, the next one and it has no unshared oxygens. Now, one of the important things that I mentioned briefly earlier is the size of cations. So here I've got those most abundant elements, those elements that make up most of the Earth's crust. And you can see here that oxygen is by far the biggest of, of those in terms of its ionic radius. Uh, this is all in angstroms. So that's 1.4 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. And you can see that potassium is pretty big, sodium and calcium are pretty big. Iron and magnesium are smaller. You can also see that it depends on the ionization state. So an iron two plus is bigger than an iron three plus. And you can see here that the silicon is much smaller. So here we've got, uh, this is only 0.26 angstroms and this is 1.24. So the size of the tetrahedron that you make with silicon and oxygen is dominated by the oxygens. Okay, so I can draw this out in a sort of flat way. So just to describe what's going on in this image, for each one of these that we can see, we've got uh, a silicon four plus in the middle and the oxygens around it. So this is basically taking that tetrahedron and making it a flat thing just to make it easier to draw. And so here you can see it's attached to another silicon tetrahedron and another silicon tetrahedron. So if it was just this layer here, this would be that chain, right? If these weren't attached to anything else, that would be a single isolated tetrahedron and you would need to charge balance it, which I'll show you in a second. If it's attached to just the next one, that would be where you've got a bow tie and you would have to charge balance, but less because one of your oxygens is shed. If it's a full chain, you need less cations still. Now there's some interesting things that can happen in here too. So if we look to this place, we've got an aluminum or aluminum that is a three plus. Rather than just sitting next to the silica tetrahedra, what we get is that the aluminum sits in a tetrahedral site. That is, it replaces a silicon. But it's only a three plus and not a four plus, so you need an extra plus to balance it. So in this case, we've got a sodium in here that's helping to do the, the charge balance. You can see here, I've also got an ion. So three plus ions will tend to be tetrahedral. That is what this T stands for, where they're in the middle of the um, oxygens. Whereas here, you can see I've got a silicon, oxygen, tetrahedron, silicon, oxygen, tetrahedron, they're sharing one oxygen, but then we're charge balancing these oxygens over here with an ion two plus. If there wasn't something joined on over here, we would charge balance over here as well. And so here the Fe two plus is char charge balancing the O minuses, and this is how we're gonna get different types of silicates. You can also see that it can get quite complicated. Here I've got something where I've got two silicons in tetrahedral sites, two aluminiums in tetrahedral sites. And now I've got a calcium two plus, which is giving me the extra pluses to make up for the fact that my aluminiums do not have four plus charge. So there's all sorts of different ways this can be put together. You can also see here, this is what we would call polymerized, where this is not never ending. You've got silicons all joined onto each other. So remember, you can have an isolated silicon tetrahedra. That is where none of the oxygens are joined to any other tetrahedra. So that's just isolated. But once you join them on, it's similar to how you would polymerize organic chemicals. Now you're making them joined onto each other. So as you make a chain, now you've got a long chain of the silica tetrahedra. That is more polymerized than the bow tie, which is more polymerized than the single tetrahedron. And as you go to a full sheet, 
that is more polymerized yet. And as you go to something that is a three-dimensional structure where every oxygen is shared with the next tetrahedron, then you have something that is fully polymerized. So you can go from something that is fully depolymerized, that is an individual tetrahedron that needs some metal ions to charge balance it, to something that is fully polymerized where each silicon tetrahedron is attached to another one with each of its four oxygens. By putting together the silica tetrahedra in different ways, we can build up different types of silicates. And there are basically six major groups. We have the tectosilicates, that's the framework, that's where you've got a three-dimensional structure of every oxygen is shared with another tetrahedron. And examples of that would be feldspar or quartz. We have phyllosilicates, which is where it's a sheet, so something like mica or talc. And this is where you've got enough sharing of uh, oxygens that you end up with a big sheet, it's not three-dimensional. Then we have the inosilicates, those are the chains where you've got each one sharing two of its oxygens, so you end up with a big chain of the silica tetrahedra. And examples of that would be pyroxenes and hornblende. We saw hornblende earlier as the, as the black stuff in the granite. We didn't mention this one yet, but you can imagine being able to arrange your silicate in a ring, and those are cyclosilicates, and they make some very pretty things like uh, tourmaline and beryl. Sorosilicates, that's the bow ties we talked about, where you just have two silica stuck together, they're just sharing one of their oxygens. And then the nesosilicates are those isolated silicates where you just have a single tetrahedron and then it has some metal ions charge balancing it. So those are the different types. We're going to focus in on some specific subgroups. But for now, I also want to digress a little bit and talk about the difference between crystalline solids and glasses. So you remember I said that technically minerals are crystalline because they have to have a specific structure. Now, when we get into some astro environments, we tend to use the word mineral to refer to things that are also glassy or disordered. So let's just talk about this briefly. It is crystalline if the molecules are and the individual units, the individual pieces of silica tetrahedra are arranged nicely. But it can be a fluid. Lava is a silicate that is a, a liquid that is a fluid. And now you've got no orientation similarities between the different pieces. So you've got, let's say you've got olivine, you've got two tetrahedra, they're next to each other. They're not actually joined because they're individual, but in a crystalline solid, they will be oriented in a similar way. Whereas in a fluid, they can be moving and, and oriented in different ways. And then a glass is basically where you've taken that fluid and made it into a solid. So now the olivine individual units, that is the tetrahedra, may be completely randomly oriented relative to each other, but they're no longer free to move around like in a fluid. So just to show this off a little bit more, here I've got, this is actually silica. You can see I've got a silicon and an oxygen. I'm showing you three of them, it's like one layer. Um, and then it's next to the next one. This is sharing an oxygen in each of those corners. And this is sharing an oxygen in each of those corners. And it's nicely structured. If we go to this one here, we've still got a silicon with the three oxygens attached, silicon with three oxygens attached, but now they're not nicely ordered. They're in kind of slightly random directions and they may not all fit together as nicely. And so what this really means that you can have something that might be crystalline or might be glassy or disordered. If it's crystalline, it can be anisotropic. That is to say that if you're looking along one axis of the crystal, it may be different than if you're looking along another. And that's gonna be important when we think about optical properties of the materials. And as an example of that, this is a quartz crystal. And if you look at this down different axes, it's gonna look slightly different. Whereas if we look at a glassy grain, it's disordered, that is that the, the various tetrahedra are kind of randomly oriented relative to each other, but it will be on average the same in all directions, so isotropic. And here's an example of silica glass. So it's the same composition as this, it's made of SiO2, it's made of silicons and oxygens only, but this one has those tetrahedra all randomly oriented. But we can also have some other things. So here I've got something where I've taken crystal grains, but now I've got several of them and they're agglomerated. And that's basically what you're seeing here. This is sometimes called white quartz. And basically what's happening is because you've got lots of small quartz crystals and you've got interfaces between those crystals, you're now seeing something that doesn't look quite as nice as that single crystal. It's not all clear, but it's still just one mineral 
but it's now polycrystalline with randomly oriented crystals. But you can also have something that is polycrystalline, but has more than one mineral in it. So remember the image of granite, that would be a polymineralic thing. It is something that has lots of different minerals in it. And again, they may be randomly oriented next to each other. And then you can imagine you could have something where it's like the granite, but it also has some glass pieces in it. And those are all situations that we may need to think about when we're looking at dust in space. Let's focus in on the silicate minerals we think are most important in space. First of all, there's olivine. So this is the uh, individual isolated tetrahedra. Uh, you can see that here. And then there's the melilite. This is the double tetrahedra. This is the bow tie. And then there's the pyroxenes. This is where you have a long chain of the silica tetrahedra. And you can see here, I've given you pictures of them. Actually, they come in different colors, olivines, pyroxenes, melilites. They can all come in a range that is green to brown to blackish to clear. It depends on exactly what their composition and impurities are. So let's start with olivines. When we talk about olivines, it isn't a single composition. So an olivine is a group of minerals. It's not a specific mineral. And we have what's called a solid solution. So you can have something that is an olivine here where we have the SiO4, but now we need to charge balance it. One composition that it could be is called phosphorite. And phosphorite is where you're charge balancing the two plus ions that you need. You need two of them to charge balance that minus four and there are two magnesiums. You could also put in two ions, that is two iron ions, Fe2+, and that one would be called phalite. But we're talking about solids here, we're not talking about individual units, and so you could have something where one cation is magnesium and the other cation is the Fe2+, ion, but you can imagine that you could have in a solid, a mixture of some are both Mg's, some are both Fe's, some are Mg plus Fe. So you can actually have a composition that ranges from 100% magnesium as your cations to 100% iron as your cations. And that's what we mean by a solid solution, that basically you've got a range that allows you to have basically any composition. If you remember back to the sizes of the cations, the magnesium and the iron are similar in size. They substitute easily for each other and it doesn't mess with the size of the overall unit. And so what we can have is something that if it's actually up to 10% iron, we would call it phosphorite. So that would be something, let's say you've got a hundred units. It would mean that 10 of your units would have iron in and 90 of them would have magnesium. It could be more messed up than that. But then we have names for these other compositions where it's basically between 10 and 30% it's chrysolite, between 30 and 50% it's high allosiderite and so on until we get to phaolite, which is where it's the 90 to 100% iron. It is possible to substitute in some other cations. So for instance, manganese is quite popular. Again, manganese is uh, similar in size. And so we call this, this one down here, the MN2SiO4, tephrite. But there are some things that don't substitute in well. And so you can get a solid solution from magnesium to iron end members. So we call phosphorite an end member. It is almost it, it basically completely magnesium rich. We call phalite an end member. It's completely iron rich. And in between, you can have any composition that is some combination of iron and magnesium. But you can't necessarily put in just any two plus iron. So in this case, we're looking at calcium. This triangle is called a tertiary diagram. And basically what you're doing is you're plotting compositions. A composition that is phosphorite that's completely magnesium rich, but still olivine would be at this corner. We have the iron rich phalite at this corner. Now in this case, we've got a composition of calcium to SiO4, but this has a different structure because the calcium ion is so big. Now you can fit in one calcium ion. So you could put in one calcium in place of a magnesium or iron and still have one magnesium left or one iron left. And you can have anywhere in between. So you could have something where, you know, on average you have half calcium and then the other half could be some magnesium and some iron and it would plot somewhere along this line. But this other shade of green, you can't get those compositions. So you don't have what's called a solid solution from phosphorite to Monticellite. 
You can't just get any random amount of magnesium and calcium. It has to be either half magnesium, half calcium, or all magnesium. And once you get past half magnesium, calcium, you can't do anything else. And this doesn't exist naturally. So let's move on to pyroxenes. Same idea here. We've got a solid solution. Again, it is magnesium to iron. The magnesium ridge end member, remember this is where you've got all of your cations are now magnesium. It's enstatite. And when all of your cations are iron, it's ferrocellite. Now remember that you're sharing one oxygen. So that means that you don't have to have as many cations to do the balancing. So in this case, you can think of it as being the, the individual units are now an SiO3 because they're sharing that one unit between the other one. You'll have one magnesium or iron next to each of these uh, tetrahedra to do the charge balancing. Because of the way that it's made in change, you have a bit more space in there. So you can also put in calcium. And so this one's called wollastonite. Down here, I've got another one of these tertiary diagrams. And what it's showing you is we've got enstatite. This is the magnesium rich. So this is where you've got a chain and all of your cations are magnesium. At this end, we've got ferrocellites. This is where you've got a chain of silica tetrahedra and all of your cations are iron. But you can't make just any combination of these. You can make some different uh, combinations along this line. And so what you get is you can make enstatite and you can make a lot of compositions between enstatite and ferrocellite. But this miscibility gap is basically where you can't make a whole bunch of different compositions. Here again, you can put in a calcium and a magnesium instead of two magnesiums, but you can't necessarily put in any combination of magnesium and calcium. It has to be either all magnesium or half and half. Likewise with the iron rich, it can be all iron or half iron and calcium. But again, you've got a range here. And there's a little bit where you're kind of mixing things up where you've got a mixture of iron and magnesium that you might be able to get a little bit less calcium in there, but then you cannot make the, the stuff that is above here. So you can't make things that have more calcium than half, whether it's the iron rich or the magnesium rich and until you get to the end. And then that's well, at the peak. Finally, let's talk about the melolites. So this is another solid solution, but this one gets a little bit more complicated. We've got two calciums and a magnesium to do our charge balancing. But here, it looks like I've got two aluminiums. But what I want to point out is here I've got an Si207. So that's my bow tie. Remember, I've got two tetrahedra and they're sharing one of their oxygens. And here I've only got one Si because in this case, the aluminium is basically behaving like a tetrahedral site. It is replacing a, a silicon. So this is more like you've got a Ca2Al and then an SiAl07. And you can see it drawn out here. Here I've got the galenite is the aluminium rich end member, and you've got aluminium in a tetrahedral site. So here's an aluminium, there's four oxygens around it. That's basically a tetrahedron. But then we've also got an aluminium here that's a tetrahedron, so that's my bow tie, and we've got a silicon here. Calciums are doing the charge balancing. So this one is a little bit more complicated, but you can make things where you're doing substitutions between the two and you're just changing out whether there's an aluminium in the tetrahedral site or not. Now, in a future video, we'll talk about silica because silica, that is quartz, is a polymorph of silica. That is, it is a specific crystal structure. So quartz is a mineral. Silica is not. Silica can be glassy. Silica can be other, other different crystal structures. So quartz is the common one that we found on Earth, but there's also other compositions like cristobalite and tridymite, which are high temperature versions of silica. They are also crystalline. They are different minerals. But there's a lot going on there. So we will, we will talk about the silica minerals in a future video. For right now, we've talked about those minerals that we think are most important for what forms in space. So as a summary, we talked about elemental abundances and how that impacts minerals. So we're going from what's out there in space to what's in the Earth's crust. We talked about the difference between minerals and rocks. We talked about the fact that silicates are dominant on Earth and actually in space. We talked about the fact that silicates are made up of these SiO4 tetrahedra and that we arrange them in different ways. We talked about the idea of solid solution. So where you're basically 
able to make all sorts of different compositions that are not stoichiometric. That is, they don't have exact, precise, um, nice compositions. And then we talked about how some things just don't occur naturally, and it has to do with the size of the ions. And so, for instance, calcium is really big, so it doesn't quite fit. And so you don't get every possible combination of different compositions.